let me ask you a question. When was the last time a game truly messed with your head? The last time a game pulled you into an experience unlike any game you've ever played before. I've had two games mess with me a little bit. Chronologically, the first time it ever happened to me was with Undertale. While it may sound like a little bit of a generic option to pick nowadays, it really is just that good of a game. It's hard to say anything about Undertale that hasn't already been said, so please excuse me while I gush over Undertale for a little bit for people that are unfamiliar. One thing that always struck me about Undertale is the way it naturally lets the player interact with the world through gameplay. The combat, the exploration, the story were all woven together seamlessly. It made me fall in love with the characters not just because they're funny, though I'd be lying if I said I'm not a sucker for good laughs, but because of how relatable the characters were. Everyone is unique and never the same. For a world that's full of monsters, it's surprising just how much more human a skeleton is than any character was in Andromeda. Everyone in Undertale is a good person, it's just that some are more evil than others. Nobody really deserves to die. Then I got the mindfuck that are its endings. Flowey being the main villain after me having forgotten about him in my first playthrough was one of the best gaming experiences I've ever had. And Photoshop Flowey still gives me nightmares really bad. The bad ending is equally as terrifying with how it affects the game forever, even in a new game. And even Flowey remembering what the player did in a previous playthrough is genuinely kind of creepy. Undertale really sold me in its music. Music goes a long way for me of games, and the way Undertale's music can go from moody and unsure to funny and cheerful while keeping the player fully immersed is frankly amazing. Dummy, Spider Dance, and Metal Crusher will go down as being my favorite pieces of music and gaming probably forever. It also inspired me to make my first video game with Game Maker. It's not exactly coded very well, but it's still my first game, so in a way, I'm kind of proud of it, though if I'm gonna be honest, it is pretty bad. Uh, more things go into games like Undertale than I realized initially. So, I mean, if you're interested, there's a link to the game down in the description, but, you know, don't get your hopes up. Then comes the most recent game that has played with my mind, and it's a game in a genre that I didn't think I'd ever play in a million years. I mean, probably even like a billion years. And that game is called Doki Doki Literature Club, a dating sim that's a player trying to swoon one of four girls. Or, at least, that's how it appears on the surface. Doki Doki starts out innocently enough. When someone would first see this game, they'd see an overly pink, cutesy picture of the game's title with an anime girl. It's also free, so it kinda makes no sense why you wouldn't even give it a shot. I mean, the game looks visually appealing. After a quick download, whoever got the game would see an interesting warning about the game being inappropriate for young children. Now, in my naive little mind, when I first played it, I thought the game was just was basically just warning me about the abundance of anime titties it was gonna throw at me, and that's why everyone wouldn't shut up about this game. I mean, it has, it has overwhelming positive reviews, even right now at recording, so people really love this game, and I thought it was just because of tits. Like, if I'm being completely honest. However, having said that, the game is pretty reserved when compared to a lot of dating sims with how the girls dress. They're all in school uniforms, and even though one of them looks like they're about to bust out of their buttons at any moment, it's noticeably PG with the girls' as character designs. Speaking of the girls, let's introduce you to them. You've got Yuri, a shy bookworm who's a little emo, Natsuki, an 18-year-old high schooler, no shut up the wiki says so, who likes manga and getting into childish fights. Sayori, the blue wide-eyed girl who's the main character's childhood friend and most likely snorts a shit ton of cocaine because of how energetic she is. Also, she's the vice president of the literature club. And finally, Monica, who is... well, just Monica. She's the president of the literature club. Getting to the gameplay, it's a standard affair. There's looping music in the background, text to read, and anime girls that just change sprites depending on the emotion that the game wants them to express in text. I do feel a little bad for saying this because of how good the artists are in this game. Like seriously, the drawings in this game are 10 out of 10, but I do wish that there were more visual actions of the girls doing stuff. Like, for example, if a girl is eating a cupcake, then I'd like at the very least to see them holding that cupcake. This is a very small complaint, and this is just a little nitpick that I had. This won't be like, no, 7.8, not enough sprites. Inherently, a game that relies 100% on text for the player to read can get a little boring after a while. 
This is one reason I'm not into dating sims at all. The game does do a good job of interesting the player with events that encourage them to read the dialogue, but I'd be lying if I said the writing in Act 1 was amazing, which Act 1 is about three and a half hours long. But dear god, the protagonist has some of the cringiest dialogue. Throughout the game, I just gave him the most annoying voice I could think to give him. I see an annoying girl running towards me from the distance, waving her arms in the air like she's totally oblivious to any attention she might draw to herself. That girl is Sayori, my neighborhood and good friend since we were children. It is better for the girls, thankfully, though it still isn't perfect. There's still anime girls who hope Senpai doesn't notice them. The main character constantly flirts with them and causes them to become shy and stumble on their words, just like a schoolgirl, and for once that description is accurate as hell. Though, they do become more fleshed out later, especially if the player goes 100% down their roots. Going for Sayori can be a little difficult, surprisingly, because at first, when picking words that I thought that she'd like in the poems that I had to make, I ended up getting Natsuki, who likes cute things like the words lipstick, fluffy, and jumpy. But when I tried going for Yuri, to my surprise, Sayori jumped for joys at word like grief, unrequited, and depression. Subtlety is the name of the game with Doki Doki, and you'll either find out the truth in time, or be left in shock. So, imagine you're me for a second. I've been playing this dating sim for three hours, and I'm starting to lose a little bit of my sanity. Not because anything bad has happened, but because for three hours straight, I've just been reading text and have no idea when the good stuff is gonna happen. I start questioning if there's anything weird with this game to begin with, and if everybody's just messing with me and trolling. Now, that doesn't mean that the game's writing got stale. In fact, the writing does get better as the game goes on. The game's creator and writer, Dan Salvato, clearly knows what he's doing with the writing even this early. But one can really only take so many long conversations. For every entertaining moment like Natsuki accusing the player of looking at her butt with goofy music playing in the background, there's scenes of the girls talking about whether or not Monica has a boyfriend, which is not very riveting. Needless to say, my sanity was draining, then Sayori got me to pay attention. Throughout the game, I'd notice her get more and more distant. On Tuesday, she's hugging the player and jumping for joy after he decides to join the literature club, and talks his ear off about everything that she's thinking. By the time it's Friday, though, Sayori is more reserved, quiet, and is trying to avoid the main player altogether. Two days later, on Sunday, before either Yuri or Natsuki come over to the protagonist's house for a club-related activity, the player character visits Sayori. And after a little bit of coaxing, Sayori spills the beans about what's wrong. She's depressed, and is becoming more depressed because she's starting to like the main character more and more. However, she doesn't want to be in a relationship with the main character because she just wants him to become friends with the other girls instead, and not waste his sympathy on her. But at the same time, Sayori's feelings for the player has grown own just because of how much they've been hanging out. In a way, she starts to become crazy during this confession, laughing cheerfully after saying how she feels and keeps trying to pretend that nothing is wrong. Doki Doki handles Sayori's depression very respectfully. When the protagonist hears that she's depressed, he immediately is there for her. While I've never personally gone through depression like this, my friend said that he understood where she was coming from. It feels like you're stuck in a hole, that it becomes hard to do even simple tasks without the feeling that you'll mess something up. I'd have to imagine that would eat somebody from the inside out. Shortly after confronting Sayori, the player spends their time with either Natsuki or Yuri, but when either girl leaves, he's confronted by Sayori again. It's clear that she's in love with the main character, but she also wants things to go back to how things used to be. Should they just stay friends, Sayori ends up screaming in sadness and running away. Or if the player accepts her offer, we'll have them hugging but Sayori still says that she doesn't feel happy. The rain clouds weren't going away. It was at this point I thought I understood the warning at the beginning of the game, but if only that were true. Next day, Sayori isn't at the club. This doesn't seem to be too weird because Sayori has always had trouble getting out of bed because of her depression, but this time it's different. The player finds a poem that she wrote for the festival that's about to happen, and as you can see, it's clear things aren't going okay of Sayori. The player rushes to her house. At this point, I expected to see Sayori struggling to get out of bed or just not being home at all. I mean, this is a dating sim after all. Sure, one of depressing themes, but still a cutesy dating sim that hadn't shown any signs of being anything else. Then I opened her door, and I, I haven't been able to forget about it since.
Sayori hung herself. It's hard to explain just how astonished I was. There's that sudden shock of seeing it, sadness, and then there's putting the pieces together in my head. But still, not being able to believe what I'm seeing and just having to accept what's in front of me. All the while, the game is glitching out and Sayori's theme is distorted in the background. The music perfectly mirrored me as I went from surprise to wondering if this was even real, and then nervous laughter asking myself if this was actually happening. It felt like I extra duped myself with my attempt to go down Sayori's romance route. Not only was this upsetting, but one of the greatest gaming experiences I've had. Sure, outrunning a helicopter as it shoots at me in Battlefield is exhilarating, but Sayori's suicide is something that's hard to describe. Surreal, I guess is a good word for it. But it hit me with a bag of bricks that still makes me think about it sometimes. All I cared at this time was the present moment. Even though the game says it's over after it fades to black, the terror has only just begun. After getting kicked back to the main menu, Sayori's sprite is glitched. The new game button is glitched as well, and upon clicking it, the player is greeted to the opening of the game again. Things become noticeably different quite quickly though. Sayori's name is replaced by scramble text, and she has a glitched texture. From this point on, things just get crazier, crazier, and crazier. So join me as we traverse through this rabbit hole, will you? The first day, Yuri, Natsuki, and Monika seem mostly the same. The complete first act is just being repeated, but Sayori isn't here this time. The poems are the same, the special moments the player gets with the girls are the same, but it's all twisted. The second day is when things really start coming off the rails. Natsuki has what can only be described as an eye and mouth seizure. Monica starts acting weird, such as appearing over text and having a completely different poem than the one she did in the original second day. Without Sayori there to keep the peace, Yuri and Natsuki have an argument that quickly gets out of hand. This stuff is weird by itself, but it's a small thing the game does that makes it even more effective. The game subtly makes the player feel uneasy. The game has random events that occur each time a new game is started. Just because something spooky happened once, it may not happen the next time a new game is started, but this time something new could happen that's completely unexpected. With my luck, of course, I got almost every single random event that you could get. You can imagine just how terrified I was in this game. Random red screens, a flashing Monica on the main menu, Yuri's scary sticker, Natsuki taking inspiration from The Exorcist, Sayori's poem about cutting herself, and a drawing of Sayori hanging with the words happy thoughts appearing out of nowhere. So yeah, fuck me. The happy music is still there most of the time, but don't get used to it because at random times or during certain events, the music will either slightly distort to unnerve the player or heavily distort. Every time I hear these distorted versions, I get shivers down my spine. The game does so many small things to keep the player uncomfortable, like having the screen slowly zoom in and tilt, to having the girls randomly freak out, and how it looks like Monica is just always watching. Doki Doki is a horror game, but it isn't a scary game necessarily. Now, this depends on your definition of a scary game, but for me, I define scary games as those that make me jump. Yes, Doki Doki makes me feel startled and uncomfortable, but it didn't scare me. Instead, it haunted me. The imagery of this game is horrific enough to give anyone nightmares. Bad horror, on the other hand, goes for quick scares just to see how much it can make the player jump. It's forgettable. Think like Dead Space 3 or something. And a game like this won't scare somebody so bad that they'll be thinking about it in like a week. Most likely, if replayed, that scary game won't even be scary anymore, because you know what happens. Good horror presents themes and messages that someone never forgets. Yeah, the game wasn't scary, but it chilled me to my core, and it lingers on in my brain because it's so unforgettable. So, in a way, the game is still affecting me, even in a small way. Natsuki's next snapping episode still gives me goosebumps, and much like the scene from Ace Ventura 2 where the raccoon dies, no matter how many times I see the scene, I don't want to look at the screen and would rather just skip it when it happens. The way Doki Doki presents its themes is in an interesting way, and it's through a way that only a video game really could do. Video games are naturally interactive in their design. This makes them perfect candidates for stories like this, 
There couldn't be a movie, a TV show, or even a book about Doki Doki. It just wouldn't be possible. That kids love this one. In the first act, the player gets subtle hints that, on first glance, don't really seem to mean anything, but upon a second playthrough show their true colors. Natsuki doesn't bring up her dad too often, but when he is brought up, it's never in a positive light. He won't let her keep her manga at her house, and she instead has to keep it in the classroom. He won't even let Natsuki have the main character come over to her house. On the surface, this doesn't seem like much to go off of. Big whoop, her dad's a dick. Who cares? Just simple plot points and excuses for why certain things in the game have to happen. But the second act changes all of that. All of the characters in the second act are exaggerated versions of themselves and reveal things about themselves because the game is slowly tearing itself apart. It quickly becomes apparent in the second act that Natsuki's dad is abusive to her. He's controlling and starving her. In the game, Natsuki faints in class, it's constantly looking for money to buy food, and even isn't growing correctly because she's malnourished. That's one of the reasons why she's so small compared to the other girls. Going to Yuri, she has a knife collection that the player finds out about if he spends Sunday with her instead of Natsuki. A little bit of a weird collection, yeah, but even Yuri admits it's kinda strange. However, it's the subtle things that Yuri does that catch my attention upon a second playthrough. Yuri lets the player hold one of her knives for a little bit, but he ends up cutting himself on accident. Yuri says that the knife can cut through skin like paper and that she should have warned him about that. The first playthrough, you'd be excused for not giving this line much thought, but the question I pose is, is how does Yuri know this? Somewhere she found out that this blade can easily go through flesh. It's not like a knife would just be advertised as being able to cut through skin easily at like a supermarket. You just wouldn't do that. It doesn't end there though. Just a little bit later, the player leaves the room for a couple of minutes and returns to see Yuri sliding her sleeve down. And as you can see, Yuri is wearing a long sleeve sweater. The player asks if she's warm and it's a logical question. In his mind, she had her sleeves up to cool off. But as we learn in the second act, this might not appear as it once did. Yuri is revealed to enjoy cutting herself. Earlier in Act 2, Natsuki accuses her of being a cutter during their argument, which Yuri denies. But later we find her in the hall with her arm covered in cuts, and even later her blood covering one of her poems with her urine and other bodily fluids as well. Yuri is easily the craziest girl on the surface in the second act. Not only does she cut herself, but she quickly starts having an unhealthy crush on her character. Cutting herself for sexual pleasure, obsessive staring, and the aforementioned blood-covered poem made just for the player all leads to a rather unpleasant experience. These imperfections of the characters lead them to become so much more interesting, both in Act 2 and Act 1 upon reflection. Natsuki says it best when talking about one of her mangas in the first act. Like, there's a really funny chapter where they obsess with a guy at an ice cream shop, but it just helps you get to know the characters. And besides, it's still entertaining. But later on, there's all kinds of drama. Like when they get into all their backstories and when some of the romance starts to happen. That's really what makes it so good. There are so many touching parts. This is a brilliant case of foreshadowing that warrants a second playthrough for players to see that some of these originally innocent conversations hold dark meanings. So to recap, Natsuki is being abused, Yuri is obsessed with us and cuts herself, and as I'm sure we've already figured out in great detail, Sayori was depressed. So what about Monica? What's her quirk? Well, it's that she knows a lot more than she lets on. At the end of Friday, Yuri basically traps the player into spending time with her. She confesses that she loves him, and she wants to know what it's like to be inside the player's skin, so you know naturally I just turned her down. It's not really my kink. Regardless of choice, she stabs herself either out of excitement or sadness. Then the protagonist spends the entire weekend with her. While Sayori's suicide is shocking and still gives me goosebumps, Yuri's suicide is admittedly kind of worse. It just doesn't feel quite as bad as Sayori's because at this point I'd grown accustomed to the horror elements, and honestly I just wanted Yuri to leave me alone. With Yuri's death, the player listens to a very slowed down version of Play With Me as they slowly watch her decay. Her skin gets whiter, the blood gets darker, her smile turns into a mute expression, and she slowly starts to lose the color in her eyes.
This scene is disturbing, and even though I've been trying to escape from Yuri for pretty much the entirety of Act 2, I felt really bad for her. After the weekend's over, Natsuki shows up and thankfully gives some comic relief. Then Monica shows up, and if you thought the game had already been flipped on its head, well then Monica has something to say about that. She opens the game's console commands and deletes Yuri and Natsuki from the game. It turns out Monica knew the entire time that she was in a video game and had been controlling it from day one as well as manipulating it. She deletes everything from the game other than the classroom that they stay in, a table, and two chairs. Monica is obsessed with the player, much like Yuri. She wants to spend eternity with the two of us looking into each other's eyes. Monica's foreshadowing is the icing on the cake because her twist was right there on the Steam store page. I'm super excited for you to make friends of everyone and help the Literature Club become a more intimate place for all my club members, but I can tell that you're a sweetheart. Will you promise to spend the most time with me? She's literally talking to the player here. Her poem also reveals tiny bits of the truth throughout the game. The flashing red, blue, and green lights that she's talking about are referring to pixels and RGB that would be on your monitor, or TV. The poems reference the epiphany that she had once she realized that she lives in a game. Even while talking to the player in Act 1, she drops very subtle hints. So quickly, let's take a step back for a moment. I need to talk about something. Right before Sayori's suicide, Monica mutters what I think is the most chilling line in the game. You really left her hanging, you know? That line shows how manipulative Monica is. In Act 1, it's pretty clear that Sayori and Monica are best friends. Sayori idols Monica, and Monica says that she tries her best to look after Sayori. Monica even admits that the club just wouldn't be as nice of a place without Sayori's happy personality. But after everything is said and done, the truth is revealed. Monica altered her friends' personalities and cranked them to 11 to try and make them less appealing to the player. Sayori had always been depressed, but wasn't so suddenly suicidal until Monica messed with her. Yuri was shy and weird, but after Monica tampered with her emotions, it caused her to become obsessive and dangerous. Monica told Sayori to kill herself. Monica's ruthlessness doesn't end there though, no no. She also watched Sayori kill herself. We know Monica watched Sayori died because Monica admits to it. While most likely she wasn't physically present when it happened, she saw it nonetheless. She says it herself, she's always watching. Monica says that Sayori didn't snap her neck and have a quick death. Instead, Sayori chose the hard way out on accident and slowly asphyxiated herself to death. Who knows what would go through someone's mind in a moment of slow suffocation, but Sayori realized that she didn't want to die. She tried to escape her noose and that's why her hands were bloody. She didn't want to die after all, but Monica allowed it to happen. While telling the story, Monica isn't sad or regretful. Instead, she just laughs it off, just like Yuri's death a few moments ago. What's so genius about how the game progresses at this point is what the player has to do. I said earlier that games are unique when it comes to story because of how interactive they are. The player has to go to the Doki Doki installation folder and delete Monica from the game files. It's such a simple idea that is great for storytelling and immersion. After being deleted, Monica begins to glitch out and becomes furious at the player. She says that she's done with him, but a little while later she comes crawling back. She apologizes for all that she did, and says that she didn't fully delete the other girls' character files, and that she could still add them back to the game. She knows that the player hates her and re-adds the girls, but she doesn't add herself back into the game. Just like the end of the first act, the player is thrown back to the main menu, but Sayori is back this time, and Monica is gone. Pressing new game throws the player back to the beginning again, but Sayori is now the club president. Everything is happy-dory as all the characters return to their normal selves. Yuri and Natsuki, who always had a dislike for each other, quickly become friends on the first day. After they leave to go buy some books, Sayori even thanks the player for joining the club and getting rid of Monica. Yeah, it's not over. Sayori then goes mad with power. It's revealed that the president of the club gains the realization that they're in a video game and can control it. Sayori takes the player to the same room that Monica had taken him to before, when suddenly, Monica jumps in and interferes. The game starts breaking down and goes to a static screen where Monica talks with an actual voice. Turns out the game designers wanted their audience to go out on a slightly good note, and Monica plays the player a song that's, to be honest, really good. Every day, I imagine a future where I can be with you. The ending feels bittersweet. The slides of the girls' CG slowly scroll up as I reminisced on everything that had happened. 
It gave me a sense that I just went through an incredible journey. The music really makes the credits work. Julian Ashfield really knocked it out of the park on this one. It doesn't have to end like this though. If the player views all the girls as CG scenes, then the player has Sayori thanking them for spending so much time with her and the rest of the girls, and doesn't glitch the game out. Though Monica still ends up uninstalling the entire game regardless though, but we do get a thank you note from the game's creator. A much better ending, I think. Replaying the game for this video made me realize how well the first act is pulled off. Even though I knew what was going to happen, I still had this feeling inside me that I couldn't believe that this wasn't a dating sim. Other than Monica's comment that's a little bit too on the nose about saving the game during the first act, the first act perfectly captures the appearance of a cute dating sim. It gives me this feeling that I haven't felt since the first season of The Walking Dead game. The feeling of dread and hoping that maybe things will go differently this time, even though I know what's going to happen. Maybe for whatever reason this time, Sayori won't kill herself and the game won't go crazy. But of course, that's just wishful thinking. Games like Doki Doki are important for the games industry. The thing in common of Undertale and Doki Doki is that they both challenge the status quo of video games. And you know what? I just realized something. Both of these games have dating sim sections in them. Coincidence? Probably. Anyway, these games stand up and yell that games can be so much more than what others would have you believe. These games are inspiring because it shows that a small team or even a single guy can make phenomenal games with a very small budget. They take advantage of the interactivity that video games provide and spin them on their head like no one had ever thought of before or just do the concept better than anyone else. And I haven't even talked about this whole ARG thing that Doki Doki is a part of. Like, Danny Boy, the fuck? Who writes shit like this in their spare time? What is this? Even though I played it in 2018, Doki Doki is definitely my favorite single player game of 2017, which means that it's probably just my favorite game of 2017 in general. Yes, the dating sim nature of the game in the beginning can feel a bit tedious at times, but the game just wouldn't work without that first act grind. It lets the player grow connections with the characters that just wouldn't be there if the game was normal for just an hour and then got crazy. I just can't believe how much went into this free game. I got way too much out of it to not justify donating $10 just to show my appreciation for Doki Doki as the batshit crazy game that I love. I know it's been a while, but I'll try to upload more often. In fact, I already have another game in mind. It's another dark video like this, unfortunately. Actually, it's even sadder. But if you'd like to watch my other videos, don't worry, they're not as dark as this one or the next one. Though, if you want to stay sad for some strange reason, then I'd recommend you go play Doki Doki Rain Clouds. Because shit's depressing, yo. With that said, have a good day.